Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ofer Benamot, chairperson of the music department, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this uh, weekend's special retrospective of composer Stephen Scott. We're about to start celebrating Steve's music with concerts, lectures, comments, and memories by colleagues, students, alumni, and guests who have arrived from all over the country. We're proud and honored to have composer Stephen Scott, a member of the Colorado College Music Faculty, since Steve is one of the most prolific, original, and celebrated composers of our times. I'd like to thank you all for coming, and at this point I'd like to invite my younger colleague, Ryan Benigali, who initiated and prepared this event to come and tell you more about what we are going to do this weekend. Ryan, please welcome. Ryan. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Ofer. As Ofer mentioned, my name is Ryan Bendigali, and I am an assistant professor of music here at Colorado College. Uh, I'm also an alumnus of the college. I have played in the Bode Piano Ensemble with Steve Scott uh, in the years leading up and into the turn of the millennium. And I'm excited to welcome my uh, fellow Colorado College alumni back to campus for this weekend celebration, so all of whom are here in the audience this afternoon. And um, actually, can I just really quickly have those of you that are alums that are in attendance, could you just stand up to see who's here? <laughs> we, have, we have with us um, new music ensemble and bow piano ensemble members from you know, approximately the, the mid-1970s through the present. Um, and it's just really wonderful to have people here and to reconnect with old friends and also meet people whom names I've seen and encountered uh, many times over the course of planning this event um, and to put the name with the face is really, really wonderful. So I'm looking forward to many conversations over the course of the weekend. Uh, I also want to welcome the members of the Colorado College and Colorado Springs community that are with us here today. We have, um, you know, you are the dedicated enthusiasts of the music of Stephen Scott. And it's because of you and your continued presence at the concerts that the music of uh, the Bow Piano Ensemble has had such sustained and continued, ex uh, continued success over the course of many, many years. And also want to uh, acknowledge the members of Stephen Scott's family who have traveled here from across the country to be with us today. Um, thank you all so much for being here and helping us celebrate the life and music and career of Stephen Scott. So. I don't really remember the first time that I met Steve. But I certainly remember the first time that I heard Steve's music. It was through the music, of course, of the Bow Piano Ensemble, or as we like to call it, the BPE. The group had just released its recording of Vikings of the Sunrise, and they were preparing to embark on a tour to the Canary Islands, where they would play, of all possible venues, a concert inside a lava tube. Needless to say, my freshman year self was absolutely intrigued, and I attended the preview concert by the BPE just before the departure and immediately purchased the CD for Vikings of the Sunrise. Now, alternating with the Dave Matthews Band and Fish, um, Vikings became one of the central soundtracks to my first year at Colorado College, uh, perhaps to the chagrin of my roommate. Um, he came around to it. But regardless, I joined up with the Bow Piano Ensemble as quickly as I could. Eventually, I took part in the premiere of Double Variations, which we'll have the opportunity to hear on tomorrow afternoon's concert. And then I also appear in the video for Entrada, which we recorded on this very stage back in 1999. I'm the kid in the video with the almost shoulder-length hair and blonde, chunky streaks dyed into it, courtesy of my then-girlfriend and now wife. Um, you can find it on YouTube. Watch it, have a laugh at my expense, but more importantly, enjoy the music. Um, it's really a wonderful piece. And it's the music of Stephen Scott that we are here uh, this weekend to really to enjoy and to celebrate. As you know, at the conclusion of this academic year, uh, Stephen will retire from the college uh, after a tenure of 45 years. Since 1969, he has left his pedagogical and compositional mark on generations of students. And I've yet to encounter a single alum who does not remain forever appreciative of the opportunity to experience Steve's music through the participation in the Bow Piano Ensemble and the New Music Ensemble. From my own experience, Stephen opened up my ears to the world. 
He taught me to listen not only to music, but more importantly, to the greater world around me with care and sensitivity. One of my favorite teaching activities since returning as a professor to Colorado College derives directly from the sound walks that he used to take us on, particularly in the experimental music class. I asked my own students to find a spot on campus, sit down, and for 15 minutes with their eyes closed, use nothing but their ears to experience the world, to notice sounds that we would otherwise tune out, or to block out while chatting on our telephones or listening to music on headphones, and to notice the soundscape of our world, that it's rich and vibrant and multifaceted, and that the soundscape, through its purposeful and accidental interactions, that it creates its own kind of music. There's a great quote from John Cage. He says that, wherever we are, what we hear is mostly noise. When we ignore it, it disturbs us. But when we listen to it, we find it fascinating. The sound of a truck at 50 miles per hour. The static between radio stations. The rain. It's this sort of holistic listening. Uh, it's a really powerful experience when you give yourself over to it completely. And Steve introduced such possibilities to me several years ago. And it's this aspect of his pedagogical legacy that I hope to maintain uh, to the best of my abilities in the years to come. So thank you for that, Steve. In a moment, I'll welcome members of the BPE to stage to give a brief overview of the instrument and some of its techniques. And then we'll have two papers by distinguished alumni of Colorado College that have gone into academic careers in music. Following each of their papers, I hope that we'll have some time for questions and discussions from all of you here in the audience. And then during the final portion of this afternoon's program, we'll hear messages and tributes from additional alumni that were not able to be with us here today. And I'd like to encourage everyone who's in attendance, if you haven't already, but friends, colleagues, alumni, passers-by, to uh, find time this weekend to sign the guest book that we have out in the lobby to leave a special message for, for Stephen. I'd like to take a moment here just uh, before we continue on to uh, make a few acknowledgments. The first is to the Colorado College Cultural Attractions Fund, which has provided generous funding for this weekend's activities. And then additionally, there's several other individuals that worked extremely hard behind the scenes to make this weekend possible, a few of which I want to recognize especially. First, to Victoria Hansen, uh, who began working with me on the early stages of this project almost a full year ago. I went back, scrolled through my emails, and found the first times we talked about it. And I've been working on this for about a year, so it's really wonderful to be here and have this happening. So thank you so much for your tireless efforts and continued enthusiasm and uh, energy, Victoria. Thank you. <laughs> and then next, I want to recognize our music department coordinator, Stormy Burns, and our music events coordinator, Gina Abendroth, uh, both uh, who are two amazingly organized and patient people uh, who translated our visions and demands into a reality from the beautifully assembled program that you hold in your hands uh, to calling the piano tuner to a thousand other little details that I'm sure I'm not even aware of that they took care of to make this all happen. So thank you, Gina and to Stormy. And then uh, any uh, alum in attendance who knows, uh, knows that, that one of the hardest working people in the music department is our uh, per paraprofessional. Uh, Andrew Pope is our current paraprof, and he's had the Herculean task of preparing not one, not two, but three pianos, three grand pianos for this weekend's concerts, in addition to all of his performing and stage managing that he's taking care of this weekend. So I want to just uh, have a big, wonderful thank you to Andrew Pope, our paraprof. <laughs> And um, then we will perhaps play just a little uh, short section of Bikes of the Sunrise.
who is Sean Marie Keener, uh, class of 1993. And she, Sean is currently completing her PhD at University of Chicago. She's a cultural historian of vernacular music in early and modern Italy. Her dissertation is called the Giustini, Giustiniana, because my Italian is not very good, but yes, okay, Giustiniana uh, Phenomenon and the Venetian Cultural Memory, 1400 to 1600. Sean is the recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship, which allowed her to have a year of research in Vienna for this project. And she's contributed to two volumes of collected essays and has presented her work at national meetings of the American Musicological Society and the Renaissance Society of America. And her fuller uh, bio is listed in the program for you to see as well. Her uh, talk this afternoon is titled, From Workbench to Soundboard, The Maiden Voyage of Vikings. Please welcome Sean Marie Keener. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and uh, let me just say it's such a pleasure to be here, so to be here, to talk to you about something that's very near and dear to my heart, as it is for all of you as well. My involvement with NME, the New Music Ensemble, began in 1992 when Stephen was writing Vikings of the Sunrise, and I feel privileged to have been there for the gestation of the and the birth of this great piece. It is a watershed in Steve's work an enormous expansion of the sonic world that he had then been exploring for 20 years. The name Bode Piano Ensemble captures the essence of the conceptual move that made it possible to have this ensemble playing the piano from the inside and doing so with several people. Although Steve wasn't the first to put a soft bow into the piano, as he's the first to tell you, he was the first to put a lot of them in there and to gather a bunch of musicians together and to see what might happen. His early pieces reflect this commitment to focusing on the piano's heretofore neglected inner regions, finding a new vocabulary for an instrument now miraculously capable of infinite sustain through the use of these soft bows. Along with the lyricism made possible by this innovation, he added rigid bows and picks and other methods of manipulating this big black box, as you've just heard, and even in the end, occasionally following the manufacturer's instructions and using the keyboard. The basic techniques of bowing and picking encouraged sectional structures, settling into one pattern and its attendant choreography, letting it evolve, and then moving to another. It's no small matter to get 10 people around an instrument designed by builders who never even considered that someone might want to get in there and manipulate the insides. A nine-foot concert grand that seems so imposing when you're alone at the keyboard feels frustratingly small when you're there with nine other players, half of whom need to get access to the notes that are in the same octave as yours. Indeed, choreography is an unspoken and often unpredictable part of the musical language of the bowed piano. In Vikings, Steve pushed the limits of that choreography by combining techniques in increasingly flexible ways that broke up the comforting sectionality that, in retrospect, as a player at least, seems easy. There's also a sense in which Steve completely commandeered the piano in Vikings. Percussive use of the soundboard, frame, and hardware is greatly expanded. New tools now crowd the felt, and a tiny drum fits over a sound hole. The ensemble at one point in the piece is unleashed to find any and all surfaces in, on, and under the piano that might prove sonically interesting. Steve even brought into play the final frontier of those sonic surfaces, the keyboard. And I don't mean tapping the ivories with a mallet, although I'm sure that some players somewhere along the line actually did that. No, in the world of the bowed piano, the last taboo was playing the instrument like a pianist would from the keyboard. As you know by now, bowing the piano is only possible if the damper pedal is down. The first step in preparing the piano is to take a specially made little wedge of wood and to place it under the back of the damper pedal. This lifts the dampers and creates a large resonating box that may be bowed, plucked, or struck at will. Touch the keyboard with a damper pedal down, and you invite a muddy mess. Bowing and playing from the keyboard are, from this standpoint, fundamentally incompatible. But, as Steve alluded to, there are some very handy things that you can do with a keyboard. 
A single person can play a number of notes at once, for instance. Once the interior of the piano was fully domesticated and its musical language established along with Steve's, or is it vice versa? It was possible to revisit the keyboard, this time with new ears and new eyes. How do you combine bowing and playing the keyboard? The answer, in a way, is simple enough. You mute the strings you wish to play by placing a finger near the bridge of a given pitch. This allows the note to sound, but keeps it from washing over everything else. It's a technique common enough in contemporary music, one of the many things that a pianist can do with one hand on the keyboard and another hand manipulating the strings directly. In an ensemble setting, there are many hands at ready to mute any number of pitches. Myself, as a fresh recruit to NME, served as two of those hands. As a muter, I spent a great deal of rehearsal time pressing down on the strings for several pitches while someone else played from the keyboard. It's possible, it's entirely possible that I was doing other things such as bowing and plucking, the things that one does in the bowed piano ensemble as a new player. However, the muting really sticks with me because it hurt. <laughs> Actually, having to tough it out in rehearsal contributed to my sense that I joined the Navy Seals of music. Elite membership, close quarters, work-related travel, ridiculously early mornings, and rigorous, painful training. Also like the Navy SEALs, the Bode Piano Ensemble requires a lot of equipment. This is a technology-heavy enterprise, and its history can be traced through its material culture. At every step, Steve's vision for coaxing new sound from the instrument requires new tools to make it happen, and new tools to, in turn to open up new opportunities for exploration. The soft bows and rigid bows were foundational inventions, each evolving over time into myriad versions that can satisfy personal taste or musical need. These implements then require infrastructure, bow traps to corral and organize the soft bows, color codes to keep them straight, felt covers for the soundboard, a bow dam to keep the bows from crowding into the dampers, and of course the indispensable little wedge to keep the damper down, the damper pedal down. All of these innovations grew from hard-won experience around the piano, developing into a sophisticated system of preparation. When I began um, my tenure as the department paraprofessional in 1993, all of the fundamental technology was in place. Steve was writing Vikings and calling on us to do ever more adventurous and difficult things. And it was around this time that I thought of a way of liberating the lowly muters from their painful task. What we needed was something like a violin mute, a, mute, a material strong enough to withstand vibrations of the strings, but also flexible enough to be fitted and removed on the fly. And I had an idea. As a trumpet player, who had recently spent two years playing with braces, this was now 20 years ago, obviously, um, I was intimately familiar with this stuff called brace guard. It's an epoxy that's sold in a little kit. When mixed together and applied over braces, it makes a smooth custom surface for comfortable playing. It looks something like this. And that's not mine, no. no. I had a hunch that if you could form it over braces, you could form it over piano wire. Steve let me order some, and the experiment worked. We ended up contacting the company about buying it in bulk. The good folks at Braceguard were a little confused, but they worked with us anyway and sent us whole jars of the stuff. With a lot of experimentation, we were able to find just the right way of fashioning these mutes. It takes some doing to get just the right amount of dampening and the right amount of give for easy application and removal at speed. The new mutes freed up some hands to do other things in the piano. They also opened up some new possibilities for using the keyboard since it was no longer constrained by the limits of the human hand, the hands on the inside. We realized that we could make mutes for individual pitches or for entire spans, according to the needs of the piece. Here you can see the results, and this is from the first Vikings preparation. The mutes are there by the bridge. It's a rather dark photo, um, but they're uh, along the bridge at the very end of the uh, pins. 
They're right there where fingertips would be. And here you can see that the lower pitches have individual mutes, and the middle span has mutes that cover multiple pitches at a time. For those multi-string mutes, um, my technique was to make individual mutes and then devise a bar to attach them, and then there's a little screw as a handle, and these things change over time. Anyway, with this little technological innovation, the way was cleared for ever more complex combinations of muted keyboard and bowing. But it also created its own problems. The piano had long been equipped with bow traps to catch and organize the soft bows. And they made for something of a picket fence around the perimeter of the soundboard and create a tiny blanket of bows over the pins. Now we need to get underneath those neatly organized bows. How are we going to do it? I give you the flap -a trap <laughs> By attaching the bow trap to the end of a transparent sheet of plexiglass, hinged at the brace, the bows can be raised and lowered en masse, cleanly and without incident, more or less. The clear plastic makes it easy to see what is going on with the mutes below. I worked with the uh, uh, with more nice people uh, here in town at the plastic supply house on the north side of the city, and they set me up with the right kind of plexiglass and the proper adhesive. Between sawing these into shape and using the glue, the air in the back room of Pearson Studio was at times a veritable slurry of carcinogens. And don't even get me started on rosin it. You haven't lived until you've been in an enclosed space with several people spraying aerosol rosin on 150 soft bows. But I digress. There's one other little innovation, moving from the mutes now, that I'd like to account for. And it's one that Steve mentioned. As you can see, both in the piano before you and in the photo, there are spare piano hammers littering the sidelines. These are used by hand using either the felt or the wood. I read somewhere recently um, in a review or some other journalistic write-up that described this in such a way that made it sound very much like we might have called up Baldwin and requested a spare set of hammers. This, of course, is not how it played out. In keeping with the best experimental music tradition, we didn't go looking for them, they found us. A piano technician was here doing a complete refurbishing of one of the concert brands here in the hall. He wasn't just making adjustments, he was doing a complete gut rehab. At one point, I came into the hall and he had replaced all of the hammers. And there was a box, a cardboard box, full of all the old ones, and it was on its way to the garbage. Now, anyone who has spent any time with Steve knows that that is unthinkable. These are amazing found materials, the ruined cast-offs of a fine piano. I rescued the box of hammers and brought them to the studio. Who knows what we could do with them? I don't remember when or how, but Steve incorporated those hammers into Vikings. They are indeed wonderful tools. They also make for great theater, a visual commentary on the undoing and remaking of the piano from the inside from the inside out, the sort of thing that makes, music, makes Steve's music and the Bode Piano Ensemble so great. We premiered Vikings in Europe in 1995. Beforehand, we gave two preview concerts in Pearson's studio downstairs. Surely we did it there rather than here in order to minimize complications. It evolved, however, into a lovely bit of stagecraft. We tricked out Pearson as a little black, uh, little black box theater. You can see here. We draped three of the walls in black, brought in risers and chairs, 80 in all, and furnished the room with actual theatrical lighting. There are four cans in, um, in each of the, there's a can in each corner, uh, and overhead lighting. And, per nap, and perhaps now, this long after the fact, we can admit this is probably was not up to fire code regulations. <laughs> Theater lights are made to be faded with a great deal of precision. As far as I can recall, we didn't have any such fading in mind when we got them. We just wanted light that could be focused on the piano. Again, in best experimental tradition, these new tools opened up new possibilities. We would use the fabulous dark of the room, and trust me, it's dark in there, and exploit these precision lighting instruments to open the piece. If you're familiar with Vikings, you know it has a long, 
slow building introduction. It's the creation of the world in the mythology of the star path navigators whose story Steve tells in the piece. Instead of illuminating the piano for our entrance, we would enter into the pitch black void and start playing in that void. We navigated the darkness with our own path of glowing stars that led down the aisle and encircles the piano like the Milky Way. And you can vaguely make them out both there and here, I see. Our starting pitches were marked with their own tiny glowing stars. It's really a marvelous bit of stagecraft that grew out of the performative space and our collective sense that this great piece deserves a spectacular opening. With Pearson as theater, we made the hallway our foyer. Here's Steve and Chris Isinger looking at what we dubbed the NME history lid. Photos, posters, at least one actual LP, all testimony to what was by then both a venerable and vigorous tradition of CC music making. With the Vikings of the Sunrise, Steve broke the bounds of that simple name, Bode Piano Ensemble, taking what had been an unusual kind of chamber music and making an ensemble and sound world of symphonic proportions. 19 more years of that tradition have passed since we put up that history lid, and it would take several more to do credit to the entire history uh, to this day, and there's several lids worth of photos in the, uh, the, the hallway out there. And, um, Thank you so much to Steve and to the music department for making this wonderful creation possible. Thank you.
promoting Bode Piano as part of their marketing device. <laughs> they should be. <laughs> Want to more about what you're doing now? Ah, um, sure. I'm, well, as, as I said, I'm finishing uh, my dissertation on Venetian Renaissance secular song, body, uh, quasi-pornographic songs um, that have that have a great um, sort of cultural patrimony in, in in courtly singing of the early 15th century. They turn into things that are uh, that are quite body and associated with the Commedia dell'arte in the late 16th century. So, so that's what I'm doing as a scholar, as a, a, a working stiff. I'm currently cataloging Philippine language materials at the Newberry Library in Chicago. So I'm learning more about the Philippines than I ever imagined I would. <laughs> that's the short, that's the short version. <laughs> um, you know, up until a couple of years ago, I was really quite involved. I was doing a lot of singing, a lot of singing at, at Chicago and um, and in the uh, the early music ensemble there. When I went to Venice, I sang in three different choirs, which was really a, a wonderful experience. Um, the, the venues over there are quite something. Um, we we got to perform for the the millennial anniversary of the restructuring of the cathedral on Torcello, which is, there aren't many millennial anniversaries on this side of the pond, so that was quite fun. Um, yeah, so at the moment I'm between ensembles, but uh, I'm hankering to do some more singing and playing for sure. This is a great weekend, I'm really having fun getting back into the boat piano. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Tamara Roberts, who is the Colorado College class of 2000, also a former paraprof of the music department as well. Um, she's currently assistant professor of music at the University of California at Berkeley, where she's affiliated faculty with the folklore program and gender and women's studies. Her research investigates connections between sound and race, centering on uh, interracial and intercultural histories of popular and folk music in the Americas. And her forthcoming book is titled Resounding Afro-Asia, Interracial Music and the Performance of Unity, which will be published by Oxford University Press in the not so distant future. Uh, Tamara is also an active musician and has worked nationally and internationally as a composer, sound designer, and performer in theater, dance, and film. Her talk today is titled, Boeing Together in Time. Please join me in welcoming Tamara Roberts. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to be here today and join in celebrating Steve Scott. Um, I've really needed a live bowed piano fix for quite a while now, so I'm really excited for the concerts tonight and tomorrow. And um, it's been really wonderful to reconnect with friends, teachers, and collaborators from the past. Um, I want to say thank you to Ryan for really working so tirelessly to put this together along with Victoria. And um, also to the music department staff for helping supporting me to get here. And finally, a big thank you to Steve for creating work that really has inspired so many of us and um, I want to wish you the best in all of your future endeavors. So I'm supposed to be giving a scholarly talk here today, but every time I sat down to write, there was something that kept holding me back. I've written about the Bode Piano Ensemble in the past. Actually, in preparation for this presentation, um, I was reminded that one of the first articles I wrote for the Catalyst as a student here um, was about the group before I even knew what Bode Piano was. And Steve's work was also the subject of several papers I wrote in grad school seminars in music and performance studies. But to my assessment, each of these pieces fell short as I tried in increasingly jargony language uh, to communicate the wonders of a musical project that touched me most profoundly at the emotional level. Not to worry, Ryan, I am gonna talk about more theoretical issues in just a moment, but I wanna find my way there by talking a little bit about dreams. Because that's what Bode Piano really is about for me, and was about for so long, dreams. 
Earlier this week, I unearthed from a box in my basement a journal in which I recorded reflections of my experiences in the arts while at CC. Amidst a colorful collection of entries by my shy, socially awkward younger self, uh, I found a passage where I described the first time I saw the Bode Piano Ensemble perform. I wrote, Tonight the sky was dark blue, and the moon illuminated the clouds, giving them a neat gray-white-blue color combination. Orion was right up and in front of us as we walked to Packard. The performances of Vikings of the Sunrise were amazing. Not only is Bode Piano music beautiful in a conventional sense, it is also wonderful because it, because it is such a unique sound. At the very beginning of the performance, the lights were turned off and tons of glow-in-the-dark stars on the floor around the piano lit up. The ensemble came out and began their song in complete darkness and slowly the lights rose. One time of hearing it was not enough, so I went back. The second time there was some specific parts I was looking for and everything seemed to rush by. It was the end before I knew it. I now have a goal in the back of my mind, to play in that group. Who knows if I could ever accomplish it in the short time I have at CC. And that was February 22nd, 1997. So this music was the substance of dreams in multiple ways. 17 years into my life at that point, I had grown up amidst a variety of pop, folk, and classical music, but I had not yet encountered music that might be termed experimental or avant-garde. My aesthetic curiosity was set ablaze, and I had a burning desire to be a part of creating those sounds. This was the first moment in my life that I remember wanting something um, that, for all I knew, could be entirely unattainable. It was literally a dream come true when I auditioned and was asked to join the ensemble. And then to think about dreams in a different way, when I was learning parts of Vikings in my first year in the group, I remember listening to the CD as I would go to sleep in my dorm room, experimenting with learning the piece through my subconscious. It never really worked because I'd either listen too intently and not go to sleep, or just as I started to drift off, part two would begin and the dark opening chords of the Caravals of Christ would come in really strongly and would wake me up with my heart racing. So I stopped trying to sleep to the Bode Piano Ensemble, but continued to dream. I use dreams as an entry point here um, because they are a space in which the unreal becomes, for even a fleeting moment, uh, very real. But they are also a space in which our minds stretch and try out ideas unbounded by our waking reality. Clearly, Bode Piano permeated my personal reveries. For the remainder of my talk, though, I will speak in a broader sense about the particular new realities Steve's work and the Bode Piano Ensemble brought about in the world. This line of thinking is drawing on larger discussions of performance in music, conversations in which scholars ask, what else is going on, in addition to the production of sound? Or more, more pointedly, what socio-political values are performed through the music? I suggest that Bode Piano is avant-garde, not only because of presenting unusual sounds and techniques, but because even decades after its instantiation, it continues to push on boundaries between mind and body, music and dance, self and other, West and non-West. Much like what theater scholar Jill Dolan calls the utopian performative, the Bode Piano Ensemble consistently performs the what if rather than the as is in sound, vision, and movement, performing dreams into reality. In this sense, it has remained on the cutting edge despite the widespread use of prepared piano in a variety of art and popular music settings. So I'm going to talk about these ideas in relation to three main points. First, the very physical nature of Bode Piano performance, which thankfully Sean actually introduced a little bit in her talk. Um, second, I'm going to talk about the ways in which Bode Piano highlights the collectivity of music making. And third, I'm going to talk about how it promotes ways of being musical that are seen less in Western art music context and quite widely in popular and non-Western practices. So to my first point. In its highly physical nature, Bode Piano blurs boundaries between music, dance, and performance art, practices historically and institutionally kept separate in the US and Western art practice more broadly. Performing Bode Piano makes use of players' entire bodies in order to reach the proper side of sound production and attack it with the greatest accuracy and articulation. Players cramp into tight clumps to bow the high strings or lay down underneath the piano to bang booming bass patterns. The physical contortion the players manifest is hard on their bodies. In one season, for example, I was forced to alter my rigid bowing technique, usually actualized at the wrist, to accommodate wrist guards I wore on both of my arms due to strain, not just from bowed piano, but from other things that I was doing. 
Uh, two years prior, my fellow performer limped around for weeks because of a back injury made worse from leaning over the piano for long rehearsals and preparation for a tour. Precarious physical moments and injuries are traded and discussed by ensemble members, and these tales are worn as badges of achievement and experience. Like the athleticism that undergirds the supposed high art form of uh, something like ballet, players' comments evidence an understanding of bowed piano being as much about the body as it is about the mind. In order to accommodate the need for much movement amidst the close quarters of the ensemble, members choreograph their movements. As important as which note gets played and for how long is how players get to their next position, inevitably on the opposite side of the piano. Notes are played, then discarded as members grab different tools and change positions to play a new note. This is very unlike a non-bowed piano musician that holds onto their instrument even when they are not playing. These movements are devised, rehearsed, and solidified at the same time as the notes, and the choreography is as much a part of the music as the sounds. Because they are so integral, the movements can actually serve as reminders as to what sounds are to be produced. Looking at a photo, for example, players can often tell what piece or even section of a piece the group is playing simply because of where everyone falls around the piano. Of course, other musical performance is not devoid of kinesthetic elements, but it has a particularly heightened role in bowed piano. The self-conscious use of spectacle is part of the musical act. I recall Steve directing us to make our movements clean and concise, aestheticizing the dance aspects of the performance. And audiences note this attention to embodied presentation as well. Surely many of you have witnessed the scramble for balcony seats um, at Bode Piano concerts here. Not necessarily acoustically the best seats, um, but providing for a view of the players and the piano from above. The desire to watch the ensemble is also based on audiences wishing to locate the more subtle movements and techniques that lead to the production of the ensemble's distinctive sound. A bowed piano viewer slash listener comes to perceive music in a new way, not just passively listening, but actively trying to locate what physical action causes what sound in an exciting game of sonic whack-a-mole. The same pitch played by two members at opposite sides of the piano is only the beginning of the adventures bowed piano provides as audiences attempt to sync their hearing and viewing. This valuing of movement contrasts with the relatively static kinesthetic decorum prized in Western art practice. In an orchestra, for example, players remain still when not playing and move minimally when they do produce sound. Movements are about efficiency and um, are directly related to the hand, arm, or fingers executing the music. The larger spatial arrangement is purposefully static. The contrast to bowed piano was beautifully encapsulated in Steve's concerto for bowed piano. I remember performing this piece entirely surrounded by the seated orchestra on the stage as the bowed piano ensemble rushed furiously around the piano in the center. Literary scholar Stephen Connor suggests, quote, the postmodern transformation in music has resulted in more than the diversification of style. It has also led to the breaking open of the closure of music as a form." End quote. Connor's comment is a useful description of how bowed piano ruptures a codified presentational aesthetic for Western chamber music and occupies a conscious space between media. Standard concert attire and behaviors are not neglected in the ensemble, but are instead refashioned in a new manner, new manner more fitting its visual components. As you might imagine, the choreographing of 10 players is something that comes about through collective effort. Which brings me to my next point, that the Bode Piano Ensemble exemplifies a model that balances individual expression with collective action. First, <coughs> excuse me, rather than Steve's authority, the group is valued as a repository of musical and other information. The movements, for example, are not as set as the notes um, through different iterations of the ensemble. While carefully orchestrated for a given performance, as the group changes, so do its movements. When membership turns over, remaining players become a form of embodied notation and share previously held knowledge with the new. When I joined the ensemble as player number two, for example, I learned many of my movements, positions, and even techniques from other players who recalled their interactions with the last number two in the group. And this information was crucial to a successful performance, um, as crucial as what Steve wrote for my part in the score. These transmissions of information are not static, however. In fact, they often bring about a performative telephone effect on the movements that are transmitted. 
As gestures are repeated, they change as various bodies negotiate ways to fit together, individual players discover what is helpful to them, and older players grow more hazy on the details. Thus, we see in this collective pool of knowledge a phenomenon known as the changing same, a concept often used to discuss similarities and differences between various African diasporic practices, but quite applicable here. A central core of ideas and techniques remain, the tradition. While each new iteration brings about variations and reshaping of what sits around this core. Bode piano scores cannot fully contain these intricate interpersonal and intertemporal negotiations. Instead, they reflect a primary orientation towards sound and a few basic kinesthetic logistics. Thus, the full ensemble is an active force in shaping how the music evolves. Especially when performing new pieces, the players have uh, a big hand in determining compositional components that will remain with the piece for future use. In performance, you also see this balance between individual and collective agency. Each player has an entirely individualized part and very frequently their own moment to shine brighter in a piece. At the same time, in most cases, the rhythms, melodies, and harmonies a listener hears only come about through the parts fitting together. Melodic lines are created through hockets, for example, each player providing one note within a sequence. And short and sustained chords emerge as multiple members sound their soft or rigid bows simultaneously. Listening to an older piece such as Arcs, you can hear that much of it consists of jointly sounded chords that slowly morph into new ones as individual players stagger the addition and subtraction of new notes. In later pieces, single members might step out to perform an improvised solo such as an entrada, and a whole new realm was entered when Victoria was added to the group as a vocalist. Lode Piano is definitely not about conformity, but rather about coordinated individuality. Much like a jazz ensemble, moments of individual virtuosity are held within the collective of the ensemble, and conversely, individual statements are made to benefit the whole. Visuals add important emphasis to this idea. Through the intertwining of bodies and unhidden, uh, unhidden and frequent cueing, the idea of this collective is rendered in space. Further, even when an individual musical voice is heard, it is sometimes hard to note who exactly is playing it or whether it is voiced by one or more players. The idea is not to suppress individual difference, but to allow for 10 unique voices to work together as one. I remember being rather moved when near the end of one piece with vocals, Victoria moved from her singing position away from the piano and picked up a soft bow, joining the rest of the group by playing for the remainder of the piece. Earlier in the same piece, the rest of the ensemble had also vocalized along with their bowing. These are gestures of reciprocity that speak both sonically and visually. One could build elaborate mechanized contraptions to play Steve's music with great technical accuracy um, that would require maybe one or no people at all. But his choice not to do so illustrates the value placed on seeing and hearing a group of people bowing together. Steve joins a number of predecessors and contemporary, contemporaries in the new music world in creating work that highlights collective participation. And this takes me to my final point of exploration for today, that the Bode piano um, in some ways muddies a clear divide between what we understand as Western and non-Western musical practice. The emphasis on bodily movement and relegation of individual expertise connect Bode Piano to musical value systems found in a number of non-Western practices. Steve spent time studying West African music and is also greatly influenced by jazz. And this background shows up in a variety of compositional elements in his work. Polyrhythmic passages in Vikings make use of the exciting pull between two and three, found in many African diasporic forms, for example. And his general emphasis on percussion, percussiveness, and interlocking patterns also draws from a number of non-Western directions. Yet Bode Piano is still clearly instantiated in a lineage of experimental Western classical music with the likes of works by John Cage, Terry Riley, and Steve Reich, among, uh, amongst many others. This arm of Western art practice is unique in its being influenced by non-Western practices and in various ways, bringing some of these aesthetics and cultural values into elite Western spaces. Of particular pertinence to my line of thinking here, it's the blurring of presentational and participatory performance in the ensemble. 
Ethnomusicologist Thomas Torino describes presentational performance as spaces in which one group, specifically denoted as performers, create music or movement that an audience is supposed to consume without taking part. Participatory performance is created in spaces in which everyone is a performer or potential performer, and the goal is to involve the maximum number of participants. Torino's main point um, in the book where he develops this idea is that different musical aesthetics emerge in relation to these two orientations, such as form, texture, and other features, and that these appear similarly across multiple cultural contexts. It's too simplistic to say that Western practices are presentational and non-Western are participatory. However, it is fairly accurate to say that more traditional and folkloric practices are participatory and that presentational performance is a product of modernization and commodification. But piano doesn't easily fit into one designation or the other. It is presentational in that pieces have clearly defined beginning, beginnings and ends. There is still a distinction between audience and performer and features such as individual soloing do occur. But it is participatory in its use of cyclical forms, engagement of onlookers through visual or kinesthetic stimuli, and performative promotion of collaboration. By drawing on features found in traditional participatory spaces and the dynamics of stage presentational spaces, Bode Piano productively occupies a space between Western and non-Western practice. It diverges from a sense of unity and decorum proffered through traditional Western classical music while still making use of its forms and aesthetics. And it highlights values of collectivity and holistic performance seen in many non-Western traditions while at the same time still presenting these concepts to Western audiences. Straddling both worlds, it is an anomalous entity in a music department and broader music world that is organized along this West-Non-West division. Suggesting the lines that we draw between the two are not always as stark as, I may, as they may seem. So to conclude, I want to say I, I called this talk Going Together in Time as a play on the title of historian William McNeil's book called Keeping Together in Time. And in this book, McNeil discusses the impact he sees dancing, marching, or making music together had on our evolutionary process as human beings. He calls the act of moving together muscular bonding and says that this has the power to lead to something called boundary loss. This is a feeling of ecstasy that can come about when one loses themselves amidst a larger community and common goal. Moving together in time, he argues, was crucial to the development of humanity as we know it today, thus a central facet of what makes us human. Of course, as these processes developed, they also became broken out into numerous culturally, racially, gendered, and other spe uh, specifics of who could participate and how they could participate. So the notion of boundary loss is never quite fully realized, or at least requires numerous boundaries to be gone through um, before uh, this boundary loss can occur. But piano is not the sole solution to this paradox. But it does provide an example of how one inventive man and a creative team of collaborators around him have intervened. When people encounter Bode Piano in the world, they, see, they hear music, see movement, and feel sound that cannot easily be placed into rigid categories of West, non-West, music, dance, traditional, or cutting edge. It appeals widely in many ways because it breaks aesthetic and cultural barriers and opens up the possibilities for what can be well beyond our expectations. And for one mixed race, gender ambiguous music student in the late 1990s, it provided a space in which the limits of other artistic spaces, as varied as they might be, seemed somehow less applicable. What might, what might several decades of bowing together mean for our coming musical and human evolution? Or better yet, how can we take what we learned in and from bowed piano and use it to dream up the new worlds we would like to see and hear? Thank you.
everything I've read around this event is that, that we're not going to have a boat piano ensemble anymore. And I, I wonder, uh, I, my question is, why not? Or why, why couldn't we? Why couldn't there be one? Now, I mean, it's maybe not a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are one or two or three uh, temporary ensembles. There's one in uh, Kilgore, Texas, as we speak here, getting ready for a performance of uh, uh, the piece that Brian mentioned earlier, Entrada. Um, but I, I think it'd be, I think of myself uh, not in such a happy way as sort of a uh, colonizer because I've been to several countries and uh, by request I have uh, helped people and tutored the students uh, and their leaders and so forth to perform my music and I'm very delighted to have other groups perform my music. But it takes uh, some education on their part and some teaching on my part or any of uh, our uh, alums who uh, have been in this ensemble to do the same thing. So I may continue, uh, if I'm asked to, to, um, uh, to do that kind of, uh, I don't want to call it missionary work, but it's, uh, uh, musical work. And, um, but also, my, I, I, don't, I don't really have uh, strong feelings one way or the other about the disappearance of the ensemble or, or perhaps the continuation of it. But I think the music probably will have some sort of uh, afterlife, uh, at least a uh, short afterlife, perhaps after there's not an ensemble here. Maybe somebody else will decide to figure out how to, how to do the music and compose their own music. I think it's a composer's ensemble, essentially, and um, uh, we just don't know where the composer is now that might want to uh, might pick this up.
means are. It's what you hear, what, what it does to your ears and, and your mind and your heart. And your I've sort of wandered off the track here. <laughs> Which is something that's inherent to this, to this ensemble, is to have 
Thank you again. Thank Tamara and Sean for taking time out of their busy academic careers to be with us here this weekend. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. So thank you so much. And thank you guys for your wonderful questions. We've got plenty of more time to talk, maybe more less, uh, less formally or more informally out in the lobby and uh, during the, and intermissions and before and after concerts as the weekend continues. Uh, but I want to move into the, the kind of the final portion of the symposium this afternoon. Uh, over the course of the past few months, I've received dozens of emails from former students with memories about their time as members of the New Music Ensemble and the Bow Piano Ensemble, as well as tributes to the work and influence of Stephen Scott uh, and their gratitude to everything that Stephen had provided them, both in their time as students and in the time um, as alums, as alumni of the college as well. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, alumni most frequently commented about going on tour and the impact of such experiences. Uh, in the early days of the ensemble, these excursions were done on a shoestring budget. Uh, Martha Baker, who was class of 1978, wrote about going on tour to a few colleges in the Southwest, and I'll quote from her, her email. She says, on our return trip from the tour, we drove through Canyon City. We decided to drive on the Skyline Ridge Road over the Ridgeback formations right outside of town. I was driving the van at the time, and Steve gave me the go-ahead to drive the route. In retrospect, that was an extremely gutsy, and it showed his unwaver unwavering faith in me, especially when you all, at all times, all you really saw traveling up and down the very narrow road was blue Colorado sky. It instilled in me a sense of confidence that my professor trusted me, and that experience has stayed with me throughout the years. Bruce Lemon, his class of 1980, uh, remembers the luxury of air travel. He wrote, quote, we flew Cochise Airlines, uh, which is an Arizona carrier, no longer present. Um, but I think it was maybe from Durango to Flagstaff. When we first got in, the pilot told us that we had to rebalance the plane by changing seats. <laughs> the new music ensemble was it on that flight. At one point, I asked when the in-flight meal would be served, and the pilot, who was the only other one on the plane with us, passed around a packet of chewing gum. As the popularity and budget of the ensemble increased, so did the touring conditions and its international reach. D. Bradley Baker, class of 1986, sent the following message to me just last night. Quote, being involved with the new music ensemble during my tender college days was a privilege and such a fun adventure. Our food on the road was actually the only good eats I got during my stay at Colorado College. <laughs> I I'm sorry about the time I dropped the Steinway piano lid in Berlin. Germans sure aren't great with their anger management. <clears throat> but even as the new music ensemble and bow piano ensembles were touring the world with trips to the former West Berlin, Belgium, Holland, Australia, Canada, Norway, the Canary Islands, London, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Italy, Lithuania, New Zealand, and Bermuda, to say nothing of the dozens of cities in the United States to which the ensembles traveled in the last, uh, last several decades. Uh, so even as the New Music Ensemble and Bow Piano were touring the world, some of the most memorable performances apparently took place right here at home in Colorado College. Both Joshua Finch, class of 1997, and David Walsh, class of 1994, recalled a performance of Charles Ives', Charles Ives The Unanswered Question, which took place on this very stage here. Um, here's David's description. This is lengthy, but I'll try to animate it for you. It was not your typical concert setup, and the audience was not told anything about the setup. So the lights go down, and we start playing our quiet, meditative piece, with the soft wind from the balcony coming down every so often, and then a man appears on stage. And he's there sort of sidestepping left to right, right to left across the stage, gesturing and whispering to the audience, very intense looking guy. And we at the piano couldn't hear what he was saying, 
but because of the way we were situated around the piano, it took Steve a minute or two to notice the guy. And once he did, boy, you could just see the confusion and then the anger on his face. Here was some random guy stalking the stage, venting his thoughts while we were playing. And of course, Steve was rather offended and his concentration absolutely broken. So he stops the piece and calls out to the man something not very nice. And it's only now that the audience realizes that this weirdness is not part of the plan. <laughs> so Steve starts down the aisle to do what, I don't know, but the man darts up the other side. This is in this, this space here. And another member of the bow piano ensemble and I give chase, along with a security guard who's nearby. Uh, we run after him um, as he scurries off campus. And then we let him go, because really, what has he done? So we get back to the hall, and Stephen is flustered and mad, and we explain to the audience that we are all going to start over, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't really remember the rest. But my parents had flown out to see us perform. And until we stopped and chased the guy off stage, they just figured it was more of the same random hippie crap that we had been out to out there in Colorado. <laughs> so hopefully we will not have such shenanigans this weekend, but you never know. If we do, pay them no heed. They might just be part of the performance. Um, and now it's my pleasure to invite another distinguished alum of Colorado College, Professor Michael Grace, to the stage, who will share a few additional tributes for us. Thank you. We had some letters from some friends and other alumni that I would like to read. Alan Kozin is the, art, is the arts and culture critic for the New York Times. He wrote, for those of us who love music in the broadest sense, and new music in particular, the joy of hearing something new is in the way a composer has taken the most basic and familiar of elements, pitch, duration, and timbre, and transform them into a fresh new world. Stephen Scott, from his earliest works, had upped the ante by finding ways to coax entirely new sounds from the already chromatically rich piano. It is as if he has, in effect, redrawn the periodic table before creating new compounds. As a listener, I've anticipated his recordings in the sure knowledge that I would hear things I had not heard before, in ways I had not heard. But within all that, the basic syntax of Western composition would be respected, even as it was being extended. I know that he has projects in the works, an opera for one, and that he will therefore continue to extend, redraw, and create his unique new universes. And I look forward to those adventures. Alan Kozin. Somebody very close to the college, a graduate of the class of 1981, Joseph Honor, who is now professor of music and I think chairman at Tufts University. My father advised me to apply to Colorado College on the recommendation of his friend, Dr. Lemon, who reported that his son, Bruce, was having a good experience and that the school had a very large synthesizer. <laughs> when I came for a visit, saw the EMS Synthy 100, and most importantly, met Steve Scott, my mind was made up. As soon as I arrived in the fall, Steve gave me some private lessons, and before long, I was helping out in the electronic music studio. Over the next four years, I had a remarkable range of musical experiences that have shaped everything that has happened in my life ever since. Discovering music history and theory with Carlton, Michael, Curtis, and Dr. C. Study, uh, Dr. C is the only doctor in the room. Studying piano, <laughs> studying piano with Sue, working in the music library with Ron Levy and meeting Edie Lowe, who not all of you will know, is Joe's wife. The opportunity Steve provided to me, traveling with and composing for the NME, meeting composers like Steve Reich, working in the recording booth, experiencing the transition from analog to digital with the arrival of the Sin Clavier, and hearing such a wide range of contemporary music, all this established the foundation for my own teaching and research. It has been particularly inspiring to see and hear how Steve has developed his works for both piano over the last four decades. His, re his reimagining of what an old musical technology like the piano can be and do offers one of the most vivid examples I know 
of the potential we all have to find new possibilities in the world around us. Thanks so much for everything, Steve. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Well, those are the two I was asked to read, and I'm delighted to read those statements uh, by a noted critic and a former student about Steve. But before I leave, I'd like to wedge in a brief comment of my own. With a few exceptions, I've known Steve for more years than probably anybody else in this room. We've been colleagues, friends, and yes, even fellow performers. I remember fondly, well at least remember, a Sunday afternoon in Bemis Hall Lounge and one of the first new musical ensemble concerts. This was probably in the very late 60s or early 70s, when it was fashionable, if not Cajun, to perform works that might have seemed nonsensical. Well, all I remember was pulling a little red wagon through the audience, or maybe it was you, Steve, who pulled the wagon. Whatever, it all made sense at the time by, at the same time, lacking sense. It was an adventure. I've had the great pleasure of enjoying Steve's friendship and witnessing his growth over all the intervening years, and as a member of the CC community, sharing his wonderful accomplishments and successes. Here's to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Michael. And I've got one more tribute here, which is hot off the presses, as they say. Uh, this one comes from James M. Keller, critic of the Santa Fe New Mexican, as well as the program annotator for the New York Philharmonic and the San Francisco Symphony. And he writes, very few people in history can lay claim to having bolstered an experimental, uncharted musical medium with a repertoire that single-handedly propelled it into the future. This is exactly what Stephen Scott has done. He was not quite the first person to imagine adapting the prepared piano from a solo instrument into a vessel for chamber music, but it was he who turned it, that vision into ongoing reality by founding the Bode Piano Ensemble in 1977. He has now spent the better part of four decades sustaining and refining his ensemble and composing a body of music that not only vindicates the effort put into this endeavor, but also demands that perform performers and composers will keep the enterprise going and build on what he and his musicians have accomplished. There is nothing else quite like the artistic realm Stephen has opened up. His music for Bob Piano is sometimes grandly lyrical and sometimes nervous and edgy, but it tends natively towards a pulsing sound that glistens in hyper-focus. It is one thing to propose a novel sound, but quite another to mold it into musical compositions that unfurl with a sense of momentum, architecture, and drama. And moreover, the demand of musicians' physical grace that turns each performance into a visually arresting ballet. Stephen has accomplished this over and over, and everyone who has followed the gradual development of his oeuvre must have shared a sense of wonder and delight as new possibilities were gradually disclosed. It takes time to build a legacy, but Stephen has by now put so many years into this adventure that his legacy has grown to imposing proportions. We have to accept that this gentle, gracious, and generous soul is ready to loosen the reins of the medium he has tended through the decades, and we thank him for leaving the sonic landscape noticeably richer as a result of his efforts. With congratulations and warmest wishes, James M. Keller. Now, um, we can clap for that one. It's nice. <laughs> Um, finally, to end this afternoon, I want to welcome another um, distinguished alumni of Colorado College, Dan Winsek, to the stage, who has a special tribute plan prepared for Stephen and for the rest of us all here today. So, Dan. I think I should have gone first, so I don't have to follow all of these academics. Um, I, don't, I have a couple of very brief opening remarks uh, before I play uh, this video. And fortunately, what I'd like to say was not touched on earlier because I don't think that quickly on my feet and couldn't change on the fly if what I wanted to say had already been covered. Uh, by sheer luck of time and space, I have been a performer, manager, bow manufacturer, occasional fill-in, rehearsal critic, video mixer, concert technician, and enthusiastic supporter of the Bowed Piano Ensemble for 26 years. 
I joined the ensemble in 1988, just in time for the U.S. tour and subsequent recording of Minerva's Web and Tears of Niobe. The era of soft bows, rigid bows, and pizzicato, and nothing else. Fast forward to 1991 and the second Australia tour, with the addition of not only multiple instruments and techniques, but a new tuning system, which necessitated bringing our own piano tuner along for the ride. After two years working in the music department, I departed, never figuring to bow a piano again. Then came the fateful phone call. Steve had a recording project coming up, and he wanted me back in the music department. I was cobbling together some menial jobs, so how could I refuse? I returned to Colorado Springs and became Sean Keener's predecessor and successor. Uh, the bowed piano had evolved, and the tonal palette and technical demands required of the performers eclipsed anything seen in the past. Vikings of the Sunrise, a two-part work of epic scale, was my reintroduction to bowed piano. The ensuing years were spent simply enjoying concerts until I was again fortunate enough to take part in another tour, I think it was 2003, this time with the addition of soprano Victoria Hansen. Since then, it has been a series of critiquing rehearsals interspersed with video mixing gigs at CC in New Mexico and the Spoleto Festival in South Carolina. I feel humbled and honored that Steve would call on me so often to play a big role in his latest adventures. It's in this spirit of friendship that I'm pleased to present the following video, a tribute to Stephen and the tremendous impact he has had on so many people over the years. I couldn't have done it without dozens of Bode alumni contributing photos and memories, Victoria's painstaking research, Jeff's input and critique, and of course this whole weekend wouldn't be happening without, without Ryan, uh, other alums, Julia, Lynn, Megan, uh, Paraprof, Andrew, of course, uh, everyone in the office, people who've been mentioned, and people who have not been mentioned, but uh, know what a vital role they played. Um, this is a tribute to Stephen from all of us. And the title of this video, which will become apparent um, shortly after it starts, is um, a quote from a woman in Amsterdam. Uh, 